You're listening to The Jay Barker Show on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Hey, welcome into the fourth day of 2024. Bath, Lars, everybody say hello to Wyatt. Got a good show lined up for you in just a few minutes. We'll be joined by Roger Hoover, who is in Pasadena for the game this past Monday evening. And um, later, uh, let's open up the can. Tim Brando will be with us. Lars, what's going on in your world today? Well, I'm doing good. And I'm, I'm sorry to, to hear that you're a little bit under the weather, Matt. Um, I think uh, there's stuff going around, at least as far as I can tell. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful January afternoon here in Alabama and, uh, not a cloud, not many clouds in the sky. Um, little crisp out there. Took the dog for a walk. The dog loved it. But, uh, I've been you away don't for mean a that while. Before, do you? <laughs> yeah. I've been, uh, I've been out of town for a while and it's, uh, it's really good to, to be home. And, uh, and, and, and Matt, I came across this stat and I don't know if you guys have talked about it, but against Michigan in the Rose Bowl, Alabama executed 66 offensive plays. 32 of those, nearly half, 32 of those plays began with a snap that was off target. That is one of the most, uh, head scratching, wow. eye opening, what the heck is going on here statistics I have ever seen. And, you know, I, I know that Seth McLaughlin is in the transfer portal. Uh, he's reportedly on his way to Columbus, Ohio. Maybe he's there now. But, you know, and again, going back to Alabama's final offensive play, the low snap, it just threw everything off. Matt, we were, we were talking last night and, and we rewatched the play a few times and, you know, the snap is low. So what does that cause Jalen Milrow to do? His eyes have to go down and he can't, he doesn't have, and then his eye, he gets the ball, eyes go back up. And this, I know it happens really quickly, but these plays happen, we're talking like two seconds. And he just didn't have time to see that if he had cut left, it was wide open. Could have driven a semi truck through there, 18 wheeler. And Michigan was sold out. Michigan yeah, they sold, they out, sold out up the middle. Box. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's just one of those plays you, you wish you could have it over. Um, and the more I analyze this game, like you and I did last night, you know, I did initially think that the better team clearly won. I don't really think that anymore i think these teams are i think the two teams michigan alabama very evenly matched and uh you know a lot of things didn't go alabama's way but at the same time michigan uh was absolutely terrible on special teams and usually when you make that many mistakes on special teams nick saban coached squad is going to beat you but uh, michigan was able to overcome that and here we are uh, with a in the span of 15 minutes. I think it was uh, eight players entered the transfer portal, uh, or was it nine? I think it was nine. But uh, and we'll we'll get into that here in a, in a little bit. But um, and you know, it, it, sorry, it was nine players entered the transfer portal, uh, including McLaughlin, who I mentioned, uh, former five star receiver Shaz Preston, and the the most notable of all of them are these three: McLaughlin, Shaz Preston, and Eli Holstein, uh, the freshman quarterback. And we all knew that Holstein was likely going to transfer. And uh, and and McLaughlin, you know, uh, wish him the best. He's a really good player. You know, he was in his fourth year with, with Alabama. He, he'll have two years of eligibility remaining. And, um, you know, he started eight games at center in 2022, started all games in 2023. But maybe it's best for both parties to, to move on. I, you know, I, I, I don't know sort of how Nick Saban feels about him. But the thing about Coach Saban, when you have your exit interview after the season, and I'm assuming that all of those have been conducted. 
Coach Saban lays out exactly your position on the team. There, there's no sugarcoating, you know. And 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 so, again, I, I, I hopefully uh, Seth, uh, you know, enjoys a really good uh, conclusion to his college career, whether that's at Ohio State or or wherever. But yeah, so just again, your thoughts, Matt, and uh, just your thoughts real quick on on McLaughlin leaving. And also just this uh, kind of mass exodus yesterday. I don't think it was really all that surprising who who decided I mean, to. Nor do I. No, I, I I don't think so at all. I, I guess what really surprised me is that uh, I Simpson has not. Doesn't that kind of surprise you a little bit that he hasn't entered the portal with just say it coming in and all Julian say him coming in and all that? Uh, I guess that kind of surprised me. No, I think that's a, and that's a great pleasant surprise because look, we all have heard all of the buzz about the freshman quarterback coming in from California. And the thing is, what if Milrow gets hurt or goes down early in the season? You don't want to be relying on a true freshman to pilot your offense. You want a guy who has uh, a year in the system. He, uh, you know, he, he knows the playbook really well. He's been uh, in action. He'll have been at Alabama for a year and a half once the season starts next year. And so, um, you know, I think Ty Simpson will play a very valuable role. And I still think there's a chance he could mature into a starter, um, you know, uh, but we'll have to see. But uh, but yeah, just keeping Simpson on the roster is uh, is very important. And uh, same with Dylan Lonergan, you know, from what we saw from him uh, just in the spring game. And uh, boy, he just he made some throws <laughs> in, this, in the A day game last last year that just were like, wow, this guy's got an arm. So um, we'll just have to see. But yeah, the uh, uh, along with uh, T- Terrence Ferguson, he put his name in the transfer portal, an offensive lineman. Um, he was he was the number sixteen overall prospect in the twenty twenty two class, but he had really had minimal production in Tuscaloosa. Uh, you mentioned Eli Holstein. He was the number 23 prospect overall in the 2023 class. And, uh, and, and obviously Jalen Monroe, he, uh, we all knew he was going to come back. And the other entries from, uh, Wednesday's exodus are wide receiver Malik Benson, defensive back Christian Story, defensive back Earl Little, defensive lineman Monkel Goodwine, and, uh, tight end Miles K- Kitzelman, Kitzman, Kitzelman. Um, so again, I, I don't think any of these were totally unexpected. I don't think they're unexpected at all, frankly. But uh, the, the big win is that Ty Simpson appears, at least for now, that he is going to stick with Alabama. And that will be really important uh, heading into next year to have an experienced guy starting the season as the number two quarterback. Hey, as we go on the break, I'd just like to say thanks to Seth McLaughlin. You know, here's a guy that the past four years has been getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. He's been working out. He's been running. He's been lifting weights. He's been going to meetings. He's been going to class. And there are a few people on social media beating him up. Well, you know, you, yeah, you people I are not that. Alabama fans. They're not Alabama fans. They're Michigan fans and, and close. And I, I, I honestly think part of that might be true. Uh, these are people who pull for other teams that just want to take shots at Alabama. But this guy worked his butt off for the Crimson Tide and for the Crimson Tide fans. Uh, please, folks, let's remember that first and foremost. All right? Yeah. Hey, let's yeah. get the break. Coming up next, Roger Hoover will be on Big News Sports, brought to you by Haley Sanfing, you know, Morgan. <laughs> Secure.
securing the best mortgage possible requires a lender who has knowledge, is trustworthy, and treats customers like family. And no one is better at all of this than the mortgage miracle worker, Haley Sansing. Based right here in Tuscaloosa, Haley Sansing has spent decades working in the mortgage industry. With Haley, it's personal, holding your hand from contract to close. With Haley, it's about one thing, you. Call Haley on her cell, yes, her cell, 205-792-1813. That's 205-792-1813. Let Haley help you. NLMS number 230376. Tune in to Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. Mostly sunny this afternoon, the high today 52, tonight fair with a low at 30. Tomorrow increasingly cloudy, rain becomes widespread tomorrow night, the high 53. Saturday rain ending early in the day, becoming partly sunny, the high 55. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 48 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains, this is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Twelve seventeen. Welcome back in to Big Noon Sports. I'm Lars Anderson. Hope everyone is having a great day today. You know, when you look at the uh, matchup between Michigan and Washington, the first thing that really jumps out is is the fact of who's not there. Because Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, and Georgia have absolutely dominated college football's signature event for as long as uh, as long as we can really remember. Um, and for Michigan and Washington, it's he- hello there. How are you? Welcome to <laughs> the national championship. Since the BCS began all the way back in 1998, neither team has ever played for a national title. And uh, I'd be interested in, in hearing from you, our, our, our listeners, of uh, what you think about this game. Who do you like in it? Uh, at, at first blush, and, and I haven't had a, a time to do a deep dive, sort of real look into this. I like Michigan um, just because they're, they're bruising play along the line of scrimmage and their run-heavy offensive style. Uh, their uh, quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, he is so poised, as we saw in the Rose Bowl. Uh, because, look, after he threw that first pass, which, uh, you know, we thought at the time was intercepted by Downs, or just an amazing, uh, athletic, amazingly athletic play by Downs. Unfortunately for Alabama, his uh, foot was about, I don't know, quarter of an inch on, on the out-of-bounds line, over the out-of-bounds line, I should say. But this is a really intriguing matchup because because you because JJ McCarthy he could have sort of fallen apart mentally after he threw that really ill-advised pass but instead he kept it together and uh and and he just played really almost mistake-free football for the majority of the game and so you contrast that where you have a, a kind of a, a cerebral uh, kind of conservative quarterback. Contrast that with Washington's high flying, uh, pass first attack. And I, I think you just have a, a really intriguing matchup. And, uh, look, I, I think a lot of this is going to depend on, uh, Michael Penix Jr. Uh, he finished second in the Heisman Trophy, trophy, uh, voting. And then he just was spectacular. In the semifinal victory against Texas, throwing for 430 yards, two touchdowns, and really, you just you, you look at the tape of his whole season, the throws he makes, it just you're just mind your your mind is blown. I mean, he is getting through. He can make throws through really really tight windows. Um, he can uh, throw with a, a lot of touch. And, uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll dig into this more, uh, a little bit later, but let's go to, uh, uh, Roger Hoover, who, uh, joins us online. 
our choices over the air, excuse me. Uh, Roger's a, a broadcaster with uh, Alabama Crimson Tide Sports Network. Uh, uh, Roger, how are you doing today? Thanks for joining us. Hey, guys, I'm doing uh, all right. I'm kind of getting back on my sleep schedule after my red eye uh, for Tuesday into Wednesday morning coming back uh, from L.A., but it's uh, good to be home in uh, sweet home Alabama. Excited for everything that's coming up uh, for Alabama basketball, uh, starting with the women's team tonight against Ole Miss, and then obviously the men's team on the road uh, against Vanderbilt on Saturday. But good to make that transition going from football to basketball season, really. Just uh, before we get into the game, uh, and also look at looking at Alabama basketball, you know, we're making that that transition. I think all of us in the sports world are making the transition from football <laughs> to basketball. Yeah, and you you do it more than anyone because you're you know these are your two sports. So, um, but just on a, on a personal level. What what uh, struck you about being in Los Angeles? Uh, did you have any fun, weird, crazy experiences? Uh, I, you know, the first thing that struck me was just the Rose Bowl experience. Uh, first time I've ever been in Los Angeles, period. But then uh, you go to the Rose Bowl uh, for that setting, uh, and after hearing all the hype, and, you know, honestly, I heard a lot of conflicting things. I heard a lot of people that loved it. I heard a lot of people uh, going into that game maybe didn't like uh, the game day atmosphere in there and the kind of the sidelines for the fans. And I was blown away by the stadium and just the history that's there. I'm a huge uh, history person, so uh, that really connected with me when you think about, you know, the fact that Alabama Alabama became a national football power on that field on that same day 98 years ago with that first Rose Bowl win against Washington. It kind of puts it all in perspective. Uh, and I love the fact that you're able to come back to a historic place like that and uh, get to play football that once again is meaningful. And that game certainly was. So that was the first thing to me was I just I love the Rose Bowl Stadium, uh, both my experience getting to be in the press box during some of the game and then I got to go on the field during halftime to interview Coach Saban for our halftime interview. Uh, I was just blown away. And the sunset was gorgeous. Uh, I just loved everything about that. Uh, so the game was on Monday. Uh, Tuesday, I had a long time to wait until my red-eye flight, so I kind of hit all the touristy spots in Hollywood, Griffith Observatory, and played golf at a par three course that was in the movie Swingers. Uh, that oh, was kind nice. of a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the low, low field. You buried the lead. Three. You buried the lead. You played yeah. on that course. <laughs> yeah, that I, like? I, I no, Swingers, swingers, that's swingers is reason. one of my all- Swingers is one of my all-time favorite movies. So what was that? Is it yeah. just like a pitch and putt, or is it a true par three? Yeah, I mean, it's pitch and putt. I mean, they give you the option to rent clubs. Because obviously, I didn't bring my clubs out to LA. Or I would have made a maybe different arrangements. But, yeah, I got a nine-iron pitching wedge and a putter I was able to rent. I mean, it took me an hour to play the nine holes. Uh, it was very basic. You're hitting off a mat. But, yeah, I'm like you, Lars. Uh, that movie uh, is one of my all-time favorites. I was like, oh, this is actually not far from a couple of the touristy spots I wanted to go to. So I uh, kind of wedged that in there. It was a pretty good time. So what would, what would you say was your favorite event that you went to, Roger? Your favorite thing before we last thing before we get into the game here? Yeah, I think it would be kind of that and just kind of taking in uh, all the Hollywood kind of sights and sounds and, you know, uh, being able to just look up and all of a sudden you're seeing the Hollywood sign uh, from the hotel room that we had at the Intercontinental, the team hotel. Uh, it really was incredible, and I think it was a really good, unique experience around the game. And then again, uh, for me, the best thing of all was just being at the Rose Bowl Stadium and having Alabama play in such a meaningful uh, Rose Bowl because we don't really know what it's going to look like yet for the bowls as part of the rotation in the college football playoff. I mean, this could be one of the last ones, or at least for the next decade, uh, next five or ten years, this could be the most meaningful Rose Bowl game that we're going to see played for a long time. So uh, the fact that Alabama got to be there as part of that, I think that was probably the favorite thing, plus uh, kind of just taking in Hollywood and Los Angeles and all the glitz and glamour that goes along and playing in the Rose Bowl. I know the game was a few days ago, but man, we're, we're still doing the, the post mortem, uh, of this, of this, uh, Rose Bowl because it was, uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily a thing of beauty, but it was a, a really fun game to watch. In your mind, what was sort of the key moment of the game? I think as Coach Saban talked about uh, when I got to visit with him at halftime and then we saw it play out as well in the second half, uh, the drive killers for Alabama's offense. Uh, whether it was Aaron Snaps, the, the fumble that the Crimson Tide had when kind of everything was going their way in the second half. Uh, and just Alabama was not as crisp 
in this ball game as we had seen certainly in the SEC championship, but really all throughout the regular season when they were able to go undefeated in SEC play. Just a lot of old habits uh, kind of popped up at the wrong moment, it felt like. So I think those were some of the turning points. I think the biggest one play that made the difference uh, was when Michigan was able to convert on fourth down, uh, you know, deep in their own territory to extend what turned out to be uh, the game tying drive. You know, Alabama makes play there. That ball game is completely over. Uh, and there were certainly some other ones you could have pointed to down the stretch where the same could have been said. But I think that was really the moment because Michigan got all the belief back once they were able to convert on that fourth down. That's uh, like quorum. And then uh, the rest of the game, just Alabama had a very tough time stopping the Wolverines. But I, I think I'd point there even more so than the overtime period or the last play or anything like that. I, I think that's where a lot of the game was decided. What was what was kind of your perception of that final play from the press box, and kind of what was your thought process as you watched, you know, the, the low snap and then Melrose just just run it right up the middle? Yeah, I definitely understand why Alabama wanted to go with Jalen Milrow uh, in a spot like that. And we've heard as well that Michigan kind of expected that it would be a quarterback run on the last play or Jalen would have that huge role in it, either running or passing the football, but most likely running. Uh, you know, I think it was just uh, unfortunate because it seemed like uh, with a proper snap on time snap, maybe the timing of the blocking would have been just perfect for Jalen to pick up those three or four yards and get in the end zone for what would have been a game time score. But it just didn't work out that way. That's sports. And, uh, you know, I think Jalen has been so good this season, kind of improvising when things uh, don't necessarily work out. You know, his first touchdown of the year was on uh, a low snap that he was able to scramble and make an over 20 yard touchdown run against middle Tennessee. Uh, it's just tough that it comes up this way at the close out of the season when Alabama had done so many good things in that ball game. But again, just some of those drive killers that uh, turned away opportunities for the tide to grow the lead even more in the second half or uh, play more off- efficiently on offense in the first half. Uh, that's ultimately what uh, sealed Alabama's fate in the Rose Bowl. Roger, can you stick around for one more segment and uh, to discuss Alabama basketball or you uh, need to run? Yeah, I can stick around. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. It's uh, Roger Hoover. is the play-by-play broadcaster and the host for the Alabama Crimson Tide, uh, Tide Sports Network. We will be right back with Roger. You're listening to Big Noon Sports. More Big Noon Sports coming up. Welcome back in to Big Noon Sports. I'm Lars Anderson. We're joined with Roger Hoover. Roger, before we get into Alabama basketball, I I have a journalism question for you. Um, So it seems to me, and this is just my uh, perspective, perspective that sideline reporters uh, often dwell on the negative when they are asking a question of a coach at the halftime. You know, a team could be up twenty-one to three, and then the sideline reporter will ask the coach who's up twenty-one to three, "Coach, you committed two penalties in the first half. What do you need to do to clean it up?" And I just, I, I like, is that a man, is that a mandate from the producer or, or do you notice that? And, and what is your kind of philosophy as being a sideline reporter, uh, for Alabama and the Crimson Tide Sports Network? And you have to, uh, you know, uh, interact with Coach Saban in a very quick, timely fashion sure. as he's going off the field. Yeah, it is interesting. I do notice that uh, from other people, especially TV, and I know a lot of it comes from TV producers who are kind of telling, you know, their talent what to ask in certain situations. And sometimes I feel like making it a little more complicated than it should be. Uh, you know, I was always taught, you know, to get to the point. And, uh, you know, I heard a piece of advice very early in my career uh, about Jack Buck talking about interviewing. And he said, people look, the best questions are like five words or less. You know, so I'm always kind of operated under something like that. I don't always get to five words, but I try and keep it quick. Uh, so yes, I'm kind of with you. I'm frustrated that sometimes they go there in spots like that. Uh, I joke that Coach Saban likes talking with me more than anybody just because I ask him the same question every time. Uh, the few times that I've filled in for Christian Miller uh, as a sideline reporter, I always go, Coach, your thoughts on the first half. And, you know, I have asked that every single time I've ever interviewed it because I want to keep it open-ended and I want him to be able to go 
wherever he'd like to go uh, with that question. And the same for Coach Oates when I do that in basketball or really any situation like that. I want to keep it open-ended. Obviously, I work for Alabama. There's no agenda. I'm trying to get out there or any, trying to play gotcha or anything like that. So uh, I do find that uh, interesting as well that, you know, it, it is frustrating on TV when you do see them try to pin people in corners or anything like that. I don't think there's a place for that. But uh, obviously, some television executives, uh, they disagree and they go in that direction. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally will laugh sometimes at the stupidity sure. of the question. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it, it's just, it, I, I don't get it. But um, and, and also, you're right. When the reporter talks more than the coach, that's a problem. But that is exactly what happens on these nationally televised uh, games. Yeah, I think so. And I think a lot of times they're just trying to prove that they have the knowledge of the sports or they want to make some insightful thing. I I just don't think there's that is the right place for it. I think there are other spots within a sideline report where you could do that. I don't I think when the coach is trying to get back to halftime to, you know, meet with his offensive coaches or defensive coaches that are in the press box, that, that's not the time to try and make your point. Uh, I think it's best to just get the interview done, get the coach on their way. Okay, Roger, uh switching over to Alabama basketball. Um, uh, in Alabama's last uh, game against Liberty, uh, 101-56 win last Saturday, Nate Oates won his 100th game at Alabama, and he did that in just 147 games, making him the fastest coach in program history to reach that 100-win uh, milestone. So that being said, what, what are sort of – what makes Nate Oates so successful? What what are the hallmarks of, of Nate Oates and, and his coaching philosophy? You know, I think he's got a really great offensive system that players enjoy playing in. Uh, you know, get the basketball, you try to shoot a three-pointer rather quickly, or you get uh, to the rim very quickly uh, and try to get a quick layup or get fouled and head to the free-throw line. Uh, that gives a lot of players uh, freedom in their game, and it's a style of play they like playing it. Everybody likes making three-pointers, uh, and he's always uh, recruited really well to that strength. The best thing about him is I think the first year he was in Tuscaloosa, he had to work on making sure the offensive system that he wanted got in place. Since then, Alabama offensively has been lights out. They've been shooting the basketball really well. The way he transformed this program into a championship program was getting everyone to buy in on the fact that he's most concerned about defense and that blue-collar style of play. I think so many people, because his offense is a little bit different than what not only Alabama had played, but we really hadn't seen it much in the SEC prior to him coming, everybody kind of labeled him as an offensive coach but he became a championship coach once everybody bought in defensively to what he likes to do and i think uh, herbert jones was the first really great player that kind of latched on to that defensive mentality that this program wants to be known for and uh, his program has been able to have that uh, consistently ever since winning two of the last three SEC championships so i think it's the fact that he is a revolutionary when it comes to the offensive side of the ball yet most of his energy and attention it seems like goes towards the defensive end for this players in practice and they get great at both sides of the ball and I think that's why Alabama has been so successful under him because they embrace what is a great concept offensively back it up with strong hard nose play defensively and he's gotten those two to marry each other really well I feel like. Roger I, I hate to be the one to bring this up but the promise this is the last time I'm going back to football at least for today. Uh, Chris Love of <laughs> ESPN just announced Kool-Aid McKinstry and Terry and Arnold are both planning to enter the draft while Malachi Moore and Deontay Lawson are expected to stay with the Crimson Tide next season. Just kind of wanted to get your thoughts and your reaction to that. Uh, well, certainly I can understand uh, some of the feedback that Kool-Aid and Tyrion have received because, I mean, they were lights out uh, cornerbacks for the Crimson Tide. Uh, I think Kool-Aid's always pretty much played at a high level, but Tyrion really grew as time went on uh, throughout his opportunity last season. And then uh, going into 2023, he became a complete all-around player. So definitely uh, no surprise there. And then uh, if you were looking at players coming back, you know, certainly an opportunity to help the Crimson Tide, maybe to help their own NFL draft stocks in the future. I certainly applaud those decisions as well. But, you know, this is a time of the year where you see a lot of players make decisions. And I think all Alabama fans should know is that, you know, they've consulted with Coach Saban. They've consulted with the coaching staff uh, kind of in every uh, part of their decisions they have coming up, whether to go, whether to stay, whether in the transfer portal. So I think Alabama fans can be pretty comfortable in the advice they're getting uh, for all these players and the different situations that pop up at this time of the year. 
Yeah, it's definitely no surprise that uh, that that Kool Aid and Arnold are going because they're they're projected first rounders, and what a, what a great season both of those uh, young men have had. Okay, uh, again back to Alabama basketball. Now we're just going to stick with Alabama basketball. <laughs> that was that was on me. Um, does every player basically have the green light to shoot the three if he's open? I think for the most part, uh, maybe some of the post players like Mohamed Wagi, Nick Pringle wouldn't necessarily enter into that, but we've seen uh, both of those guys knock down some good three-pointers at times this year. Uh, obviously, Grant Nelson's so dynamic to watch him score outside and inside. But, uh, yeah, again, NATO's his offense. Uh, you're going to shoot a lot of three-pointers or get to the rim. you got to do one of those two things within the first five or seven seconds of the shot clock. So <laughs> no matter who's got the ball, uh, yeah, it's pretty much time to let it fly. Um, okay, so Alabama is heading into conference play against uh, Vandy. So let's just uh, give me your assessment of Alabama's performance in non-conference play, and uh, you know what what was good and what needs to be improved upon. Well, I think defensively is where this group program is still working uh, to find some consistency. Uh, certainly found it against Liberty in the last game uh, in Birmingham on Saturday, uh, holding a very good Liberty team, probably a that will win the Conference USA uh, prior to the loss has been top 50 in the net. So that was a quad one game when the game started, maybe not necessarily when the game ended with how how, how well Alabama played, but the defense has got to be an improvement for this group. And they've been tested defensively as much as you can be tested with the great schedule they had against uh, teams like Purdue, Creighton, Arizona. I mean, that is the best competition you can possibly see if you're a college basketball team playing non-conference play. So I feel like there are some good lessons learned uh, from those games that trying to defend without fouling is going to be so critical for this group moving forward. But uh, offensively, again, Alabama's playing at a high level. I need Aaron Estrada to stay consistent with his scoring. And then I feel like we know what we're going to get every time out from Mark Sears. And he has the ability to take over a game like he did the Purdue game and kind of put the team on his back and just let him get downhill or pop a quick three-pointers and score. Uh, he is a dynamic player that could be the SEC player of the year if he continues the pace that he's been on all throughout this season. So I think those are some areas for fans to feel good. Offensively, you know we're going to get a game in, game out, but it's got to be on the defensive end where this team makes the most uh, improvements. And if they do that, they can once again be right there in title contention to try and win now three of the last four SEC championships. But it's got to start on the defensive end for this group to do something special this year. Roger, after seeing everything that the, the Crimson Tide have put together so far this season, we've seen them, we've seen them with a really high offensive output. We've seen them with a really kind of iffy offensive output. What do you expect from this team heading into SEC play starting this weekend? Well, the defenses they're going to be going up against are going to be a lot stronger than what they faced, even though, again, they were able to put up a lot of points against that brutal three-game stretch away from Coleman Coliseum against Purdue, Creighton, and Arizona. Uh, but, you know, SEC teams, uh, they kind of see you year in, year out. They know your tendencies. Uh, they're going to defend Alabama really toughly. That's why I can't wait to see this game on Saturday against a Vanderbilt team that has been struggling so far this year. But Vanderbilt had some good wins against Alabama under Jerry Stackhouse the last few years. He knows how to defend this system. Let's see how Alabama performs when you're going up against a team that kind of knows all your tricks. And that's certainly going to be the case on Saturday uh, in Memorial Gymnasium. So I, I think that's something that, again, this team is going to work on and making sure they have consistency on both sides of the ball. But the talent's there. This is a very talented roster, and it's a really good chemistry on this team. Uh, that's something I got to uh, even see in some of the uh, road games I've called for them in Toronto and in Birmingham this past uh, week uh, for the Steam Newton Classic. Uh, this group that loves each other and loves playing around each other. The new coaches have fit in really well. The new, three new assistants that are on Coach Oates' staff. So there's a lot of positivity for this group, even with some of the tough losses they've had to deal with. I think they know that those losses are helping make them better and are giving them a chance to have a deeper run in the NCAA tournament than what we've seen. Roger, of all the new players on this team, and it seems like that's about 90%. <laughs> I don't know what exactly <laughs> the percentage is, but I, I was really most intrigued with uh, Grant Nelson, the uh, transfer from North Dakota State, and I, and I, I still think he's going to be just an absolutely terrific player, but can you just talk about the, the transition that he's had to go to from playing again at, at North Dakota State where he absolutely dominated and I believe some NBA scouts uh, had him as high as a possible first round draft pick uh, to transitioning to the SEC and playing teams like Arizona, Purdue, and Creighton. 
<laughs> yeah, it's definitely a tough transition, and he still has all that skill set that scouts love, and obviously the size, and now he's just got to back it up with consistent play because we've seen him uh, put together some really good performances for the Crimson Tide to start the season, but got to find some consistency, especially from scoring and his outside shooting, and that's something he's able to do pretty routinely in practice. I know uh, there were some long stretches in that uh, tough three-game stretch where he couldn't uh, hit from beyond the arc, but he's somebody that's, again, a dynamic scorer. He's a great defender as well, and even if some shots have not been falling on the offensive end, the coaching staff has loved what he has brought defensively to this team. So I I think that's a really good sign for him moving forward. He's too good a shooter. I mean, the shots are going to be falling for him, and I think that should be, uh, you know, if you're an SEC team getting ready to defend Alabama, you cannot leave him open because he has the ability to really pour it on from the outside the arc. You add that to Aaron Estrada, Mark Sears. I mean, that's a tough three-headed scoring monster for the Crimson Tide that we could see game in, game out, and that's, again, going to make life very tough for opponents in the SEC uh, trying to slow down this Alabama team this year. What do you make of the decrease in Jaron Stevenson's minutes? Was it a rotation thing for a couple of games, or were some other guys stepping up, or just what What do you make of his, I don't want to say decreased role, but the, the lack of minutes the last couple of games? Yeah, I think it's just trying to find consistency in overall team performance, uh, first and foremost, and you know, trying to make sure they have the five on the floor that make the most sense for that specific matchup. Uh, I think that's a huge part of it. And then uh, he's a freshman. You know, He's a young freshman as well, reclassified to be in this group. So I think he's still trying to find his footing in college basketball, but the talent's there. I mean, we've seen that all throughout the season, and he is going to win some key games, I feel like, for Alabama once we get that SEC play. Great stuff, Roger, as always. Uh, can you tell our listeners how to follow you? Yeah, yeah, you can follow me online, Roger underscore Huber. A lot of behind-the-scenes content when it comes to Alabama athletics. And then uh, follow the Crimson Side Sports Network. Uh, we have a streaming show coming up at 2 o'clock, Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. We have that each and every Thursday at 2 o'clock. And then uh, we have a lot of our content available as well, Alabama Insider Podcast, and then the CTSN YouTube page for the latest on the side. But thank you guys for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. You're a pro's pro. Really appreciate it. That's Roger Hoover. You're listening to Big News Sports. We'll be right back. Did you know Laura Lee Thompson is known as the Bama Broker? She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. Throughout the entire process, the Bama Broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama broker who's as roll tied as houndstooth will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205-790-7229. Again, that's 205-790-7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee at the Bama broker.com. That's Laura Lee at the Bama broker.com. Football. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. Mostly sunny this afternoon. The high today, 52. Tonight, fair with a low at 30. Tomorrow, increasingly cloudy. Rain becomes widespread tomorrow night. The high, 53. Saturday, rain ending early in the day, becoming partly sunny. The high, 55. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 49 degrees in Tuscaloosa. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. back in big noon sports i'm lars anderson we just heard from roger hoover uh pretty interesting stuff wyatt um sticking with the 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 rose bowl Wyatt, i want to get your perspective um and i want to ask you the same question i asked roger to you what was the key moment of this game as roger said it was the 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 fourth and two that michigan converted in their own territory which uh kept that final drive in in uh in in regulation alive uh is that the play that you focus on as well yeah that's that's kind of one of the big turning points in the game in my opinion another big turning point in that game i would say is probably like pretty early in that game uh 
very early in that game, actually, the first play from scrimmage, the Caleb Downs interception, non-interception. I, I mean, if his foot is a quarter of an inch, a, a millimeter, it further inbounds, that's that's an interception. J.J. McCarthy is, is rattled right out the gate. And Alabama gets the short field. I understand Alabama scored on their first offensive possession, but... Still, Alabama gets a short field. They capitalize on the turnover, at least get three points, probably get seven. And and you, I think you start to see the offense kind of take shape, get it out in rhythm a little bit earlier in that game. Because cause Michigan, really and truly, Michigan was – they had a great defensive game plan. They were going to blitz. They were going to overload a, an offensive line that has struggled all season and, as we learned after the game, was playing a little bit injured and dinged up. So, you know, Michigan just – they came out firing and, and they would, they stared down the, the dragon and said, we're we're not going to let you intimidate us. That script A doesn't mean anything when the block M holds just as much weight. Yeah, I, I thought uh, Michigan's defensive game plan was really good because they basically said, we are not going to let Jalen Milrow throw a deep ball over our head. And they essentially kept all of the Alabama receivers in front of them. And, and Jalen tried to take some shots, right? And he, he throws a beautiful, accurate, deep ball. And Michigan just said, no, we're not going to do that. We are going to force you, Jalen Milrow, to do what you have struggled with all season long. And that is hit the intermediate pass against us. You know, hit, hit the crosser at, uh, 50, 10 to 12 to 15 yards down the field. And th- those are throws, frankly, that, that Jalen has just missed this year consistently. And so, I mean, it, it's not rocket science what Michigan did. This is what kind of what any defensive coordinator would do. Um, surprised that actually Georgia didn't kind of play the same defense. I mean, and, and you look at uh, Alabama's final uh, play in regulation. It's a third and ten, and, <laughs> and and you see like screenshots of it. They are just they 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 put basically three DBs right at the sticks, right at the ten yard mark yard mark, and then two safeties behind them. <laughs> and they're like, all you gotta do is just throw it and hit that intermediate or take the dump down, check down. Yeah. And they consistently made Jalen do that. And, you know, Alabama without the big play is a uh, kind of a different offense. And, uh, I, I would say that, I mean, you know, I'm no coach. I've, I've written books with coaches. <laughs> I've covered coaches. I've talked with coaches all my life, basically, it seems like, but. Jalen really needs to work on his timing with the receivers on those, uh, those like three step drop throws where once your back foot hits the, 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 the base of your drop, you release the ball, right? Those timing throws is really what, uh, Alabama struggled with this year. And, uh, I mean, Wyatt, I'll just ask for your assessment. Do you, do you agree with that? I mean, and, and did you see anything in Michigan's defensive game plan that you necessarily hadn't seen other defenses do against Alabama? Yeah. And, and I, I want to preface this by saying I'm no coach. I played defensive line for, for one year in high school and I was the nose tackle. They, they told me you, it is your job to get as big as possible so as many guys have to block you as possible. So by no means am I over here analyzing scheme and fully understanding everything, but, but like you said, Michigan's def- Michigan's defenders, they knew what, they knew what we were good at. They knew that we liked to run the ball. They knew that we liked to establish a good solid, uh, deep shot. You know, they, they knew that We've struggled in the short and the intermediate passing, and we saw it several times again during that Rose Bowl. There were a lot of intermediate passes, a lot of short passes that just kind of, you know, sailed sailed a couple too many yards to the right or to the left or dropped to the feet of a receiver. And, you know, Michigan, they did a great job. Oftentimes, that I, oftentimes watching that game, I could see like, hey, they are sending seven and eight guys. There are seven and eight guys standing in the box right here. Why are we not? Yeah. Why do we not run a little? You know, a crossing route. You know, put slide Isaiah Bond in the slot here and just just say, hey, five yard drag, five yard cross or something. Just just get open, and and re, and it just didn't happen. So I, for me, it was I was more critical of Alabama's offensive game plan than I was 
of really anything else. I mean, we were able what to run was the ball. Alabama's offensive game plan. I wish I could tell you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was we we could run the ball. Like you very clearly could see that Alabama could run the ball. Jace McClellan had I think almost ninety yards rushing, including the long touchdown to open the game. At, Isn't that what Alabama fans are always saying? Run the damn ball. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You know, we were <laughs> we were screaming that at, you know, Lane Kiffin back when Jalen Hurts was the starting quarterback. We were yelling it at, you know, Bill O'Brien. It's, hey, you've got a dynamic running back. Run the freaking football. And, and they just wouldn't. And it seems like Tommy Reese has kind of fallen into the same scheme a little bit here. You know, Jam, Jam Miller had 11 yards on one carry. Why is Jam Miller only getting one carry? Justice Haynes came in and looked like the spark that the offense has been needing all season. I, he was where, where, Okay, Wyatt, where has he been all year? I mean, I, I don't understand that. I don't I don't either. I mean, if, if you look, you know, I've, I've been to just about every home game this season. I'm blessed to say that. And every time out in warm-ups, I see Justice Haynes is running around with, with an elbow brace. So I don't know. Was it an injury that was keeping him off the field? Or was it simply just the depth chart? Alabama, or Nick Saban is known to, to kind of lean the seniority route, lean on the guys that have got the experience in these type of positions. And Jason Roydell had that experience. They've been with the team for, for years. You know, they're seniors. Justice, just Justice Haynes is only a true freshman, but he, he made the most of his opportunity. Props to him. You know, he he did a very good job. And I am I was very he shocked great. that they didn't kind of lean on the hot hand there when they've known. We've been known to kind of lean on the hot hand at the national championship against Georgia the first go around. Najee Harris had barely played all season, was thinking about transferring, and then he's the leading rusher in the national championship. So I'm not entirely sure why they didn't lean on the run game a little bit more when it seemed to be working, but everybody everybody's a genius in hindsight, right? Oh, yeah. No, it's very easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. Uh one more thing before we go to break, Wyatt. Uh, is there a true number one receiver on this team right now? I, out, off this past year's team, I would say no. Um, Jermaine Burton kind of got the majority of the yardage and the targets, but he was just a safety net for, for Jalen Miller. Isaiah Bond's got the potential for next season. I think Isaiah Bond, it could be that guy. If, if we've got a quarterback that can, that can hit the intermediate or the short routes. And I'm not calling for a QB change necessarily. I'm just saying that's an area of need. That's an area that Jalen Milrow and the offense as a whole has to improve on. So, you know, I would say passing academies and things like that are going to be big this season and just stay and working together, developing chemistry with, with the offense, with new receivers. Cause the, as of right now, the plan is for Jermaine Burton to be gone. Uh, that's not breaking news. Jermaine Burton has been in college football a very long time. He's a good player. As of right now, the plan is for him to to head on to the next level, and we wish him the best of luck there. But, you know, Jalen Hale, he got reps. He played in that Michigan game. I went back and watched it, but he didn't get any targets in that Michigan game. You've got a bunch of young receivers. You've got a five-star wide receiver that might potentially be signing here in about a month who is going to get reps early. So he's one of those guys. These are the players that Jalen Miller was going to have to develop chemistry with, and they're going to have to understand the way he runs an offense. Wyatt, let's continue this conversation uh, in the next hour about Alabama's offense and, and where the Crimson Tide offense goes from here. All right, you're listening to Big Noon Sports. We'll be back. We got Tim Brando joining us in about 16 minutes. Tune in to WTBC Tuscaloosa and W265CG Tuscaloosa, a Town Square media station. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. From the Fox Sports Studios in Los Angeles. Here's Kevin Wire. Some NBA news as the league has announced they are fining the Brooklyn Nets $100,000 for violating the league's player participation policy in connection with the team's game against the Milwaukee Bucks on December 27th. Following an investigation, including review by an independent physician, the NBA determined that four Nets rotation players who did not participate in the game could have played under the medical standard in the player participation policy, which was adopted prior to this season. The organization's conduct violated the policy, which is intended to promote player participation in the NBA's 82-game regular season. Another report earlier this morning from The Athletic saying that there is a growing disconnect between Darvin Ham and the Lakers' locker room stemming from disjointedness 
tightness around rotation and adjustments. And in Major League Baseball, multiple outlets reporting that the Braves and Chris Sale in agreement on a two-year contract extension. Covering SEC sports like Kudzu on the roadside, this is Big Noon Sports. Welcome back in to Hour 2, Big Noon Sports. I'm Lars Anderson. Wyatt, I, I, I just looked this up, and I, I'm actually I'm blown away by this uh, because you had referenced Ryan Williams. I don't know if you said him by name, but a, a true freshman starting at wide receiver next year. Yeah, that was a reference to Ryan. Yeah, so Ryan uh, just named the uh, Gatorade Alabama Player of the Year for the second straight season. Uh, he caught 19 touchdown passes and, uh, for, um, who, who did he play for? Uh, Sarah Land. Sarah Land. Thank you. What struck me is the kid is still 16 years old. <laughs> he's 16. So he's scheduled to sign on February 9th, which is his 17th birthday. <laughs> and he's still, he hasn't yet signed. Right, we all think he's going to Alabama. He, he's he's verbally committed to Alabama, but he's still going to take official visits to Alabama on January twentieth, Texas January twenty seventh, Auburn February third. All right, so Wyatt, I, I am no recruiting person at all. Tell me, is there a chance that Ryan Williams flips? Everything is very fluid, as always, with recruiting. I think any recruiting expert will tell you that. By no means am I a recruiting expert. Um, I like to think I have a little bit more of some information in Sarah Land and, and down there, considering that was my alma mater in 2019, and I actually played for Coach Jeff Kelly down there as well. That was my one year of high school football was for uh, Coach I think that Jeff gives Kelly. You, uh, that makes you an expert on uh, Ryan Williams. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I drop some drop some information on us. I covered him a couple years ago, and you know his his family had told me well before the announcement was made that reclassification was was very likely for Ryan. And you know, uh, losing Holman Holman Wiggins is is big regardless. Uh, but if if you go back and look at it, I believe it was on twenty four seven Sports. His primary recruiter actually changed. I went back and looked at it. It, his primary recruiter changed about around the time of the Iron Bowl from from Wiggins to T Rob, and so I I thought it was a little weird, but I was thinking, okay, well, T, T Rob and Ryan's dad probably have some connection, both being around Auburn and in and around Auburn around the same time. I want to say, don't quote me on that one, but but I thought it was very interesting, and that was kind of my first idea that the hand had been tipped that Wiggins may have been may have been heading out somewhere. Um, but as far as I know, Ryan is still fully with Alabama. If you go look at his Instagram and his TikTok and the whole nine yards, he's he's posting videos with about you know Roll Tide Willie and I don't I don't give a darn about nothing but the Tide and he's wearing a Nick Saban shirt after the All Star game. So as far as I know right now, Ryan Williams is is fully locked into Alabama. There's there should really be no no room to to question his decision as of right now. Yeah, in Look, uh, Al- like Mr. Football, the Mr. Football Award, uh, which is going to be announced in, uh, it, it's, it's done, it, it's an award given by the uh, Alabama Sports Writers Association, uh, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I think I'm right, but, uh, that's going to be awarded January 16th. He won it last year. If he wins it again this year, he'd be the first repeat winner in the 42 year history of the award. And he's got a real shot. Okay. Yeah, it, it certainly looks like it. All right, so break down his sort of skill set for us. I, I didn't realize that uh, that you had a real familiarity with him. Uh, listed at 6'1", 175. Again, he's still 16 years old, so he's growing into his body. But, uh, man, you watch him play. He is just so smooth. I always thought it was really funny, real, real quick, hitting on his age again. He he won the the Alabama or Gatorade Player of the Year for the state of Alabama and couldn't drive himself to the ceremony. He had to catch a ride <laughs> to go get this that. award, being the best player in the state of Alabama. It was it was funny as all get out to me. But um, wow, no, his skill set. I I see a lot of people compare him to to Devonte Smith, and I. 
I see that. I mean, he he gets open and he's got great hands, but but really and truly, I compare his skill set and his route running more to that of Jerry Judy to stay, you know, kind of in the recent Alabama wide receiver scheme. With the ball in his hands, he is he can make any cut. He can make any. He can do anything on the field with the ball in his hands. I mean, he he's played wildcat quarterback. He's played running back. He's played wide receiver for Sarah Land. And every field he steps on, he seems like he's the best player on the field. You know, watching him and Jalen Mbakwe go go stride for stride and shot for shot in that state championship game may have been one of the best events that I've covered in a very long time. And then to turn around, reclassify, and then immediately go to the All Star game uh, or the Alabama Mississippi All Star game in in Hattiesburg and just completely dominate that game and then turn around uh, a couple days ago and play in the I think it was the Under Armour All-American game and caught two touchdowns and threw a two-point conversion he really can do it all but watching him play like his his knee will be just an inch off the ground and he's not like he's not going down his knee is an inch off the ground and he's getting ready to make a cut and just make defenders look silly so his skill set I think after the catch is is very Jerry Judy-esque in my opinion but I see the Devontae Smith comparisons and I don't knock it I definitely think it's a possibility so I, I, I'm curious, um, what is the logic behind him wanting to reclassify into the class of 2024 as opposed to 2025? Is it because uh, he wants to just accelerate his uh, sort of uh, the steps up the ladder to the NFL or is there something else going on? He's just that good, in my opinion, you know, I, and I think he sees it that way. He says, hey, I'm, I'm that good. I walk onto every field down here in, in Class 6A in Mobile County, which is a really good class. I mean, they, they yeah. boast, you know, Spanish Fort. Uh, they play Daphne every year, and a couple years ago they came up to – to the Birmingham area and played Hewitt Trustful, you know, so they're playing a lot of the top competition in the state and he's dominating everybody. So I think he just sees himself as that good of a receiver and, and he loves, he loves the idea of college football. He loves the idea of playing in front of 101,000 fans, you know, every single week. And he just, he sees himself as he can be that good. And to me, he's the best prospect to come out of the state since Julio Jones. I mean, that that is saying something because I, you know I've written a lot about Julio and I, I firmly believe that Julio is the number one most important recruit of the Saban era, um, and we don't have to get into that now. But so so he, Williams is going to take official visits again to Alabama on January twentieth, Texas January twenty seventh, Auburn February third. You think there's a chance that Texas or Auburn steals him away from? Nick Saban and the Tide? That Texas visit is an interesting one because you've really only heard the smoke about Auburn and Alabama being the two kind of front runners. But keep in mind, his quarterback, four-star quarterback K.J. Lacey, is committed to Texas. Texas is not out of the running there. And Ryan and K.J. have both mentioned that they want to play together in college football. Obviously, everybody who says they want to play with somebody in college football, that doesn't always happen. But to be able to play with your quarterback at both the high school and the college level is influential for somebody's development. I mean, Kyle McCord and and Marvin Harrison Jr. played together in high school, and they were together at Ohio State. So it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility by any means. And, of course, you get an offensive mind like Steve Sarkeesian and – who I think is one of the two best mind, offensive minds in college football right now, it definitely could be a possibility. Now, I don't think Texas... Who's the will, other one? Uh, Lane Kiffin. Yeah. I, I've got Sark and Kiffin as my top two right now. Just offensive minds, not, not head coaches, yeah. but offensive minds. But, man, it's just... It's not out of the realm of possibility by any means, but as, as far as I know right now, it is it is Alabama and it is Auburn, and there's really no competition for for who's the better program right now for Ryan Williams. You think Auburn's going to go out and get a uh, transfer portal quarterback? I've seen that they're mentioned in a couple names. Uh, I've seen a couple rumors. Cam Ward has been rumored to them. They've they've just been linked to that Liberty quarterback who just entered the portal. His name escapes me right now, but but I think Auburn could. Uh, you know, I, there was a rumor or a report, I forget which one, that came out that the quarterback op- the quarterback competition's open again. Peyton Thorne has not looked good. He did not look good throughout the whole throughout the entire season. And at points in the season, Robbie Ashford was getting was getting significant snaps at that quarterback position. Now he's entered the transfer portal, but a transfer quarterback could very easily be possible, especially with the talent that Auburn brought in in that wide receiver room in, in Perry Thompson and Cam Coleman. 
And, and before we go to break, one one more question for you, Wyatt. There was a rumor going around, and it gained so much steam. ESPN was talking about the rumor, and that was that Nick Saban was about to retire. How, how does something like that start? I mean, where do you think that came from? It's hopeful fan bases, coaches who are trying to negatively recruit and say, hey, you know, he's kind of old. He, he might retire soon. I thought I heard something the other day about that. It's it's negative recruitment, and it's and it's – it's hopeful fan bases. I, I just retweeted a tweet on my social media account that uh, somebody from Next Round Live was saying that they think Nick Saban is going to retire. Well, Kristen Saban responded to it on Instagram and said, well, that's just silly. So, you know, I mean, uh-huh, it, uh-huh. how how much closer can you get than than the daughter of the man himself? You know, I mean, yeah. and I, I like to think she knows what she's talking about when it comes to her dad. All right, man. Great stuff, Wyatt. Uh, you and I, we're going to talk to Tim Brando. On the other side, you're listening to Big News Sports. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. Mostly sunny this afternoon, the high today 52, tonight fair with a low at 30. Tomorrow increasingly cloudy, rain becomes widespread tomorrow night, the high 53. Saturday rain ending early in the day, becoming partly sunny, the high 55. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 52 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The best sports talk in Alabama. This is Big Noon Sports. Sports. All right, we're efforting to get Tim Brando, uh, but as we do that, I want to go back to the national championship game between Michigan and Washington. My buddy Bruce Feldman, uh, who uh, we have uh, been been tight for a long time. Hey, before we get into Bruce Feldman soaring the athletic, let's go to Tim Brando. Tim, how are you doing, my friend? How about that? We have that in common. We both have a friendship with Bruce Feldman. Who knows, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, Bruce has uh, Bruce has twins. I have twins, and uh, you know, we we <laughs> talk more about uh, <laughs> and we both had kids later in life, uh, so we end up yeah. talking more about. Uh, kids and babies and diapers and all that stuff. But how, how, yeah. how are you doing, Tim? Where, where are you now? I'm great. I'm great. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, I've got grandbabies younger than your kids. So, so there you go. Yeah. So, hey, wait, does, 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 does grandpa change diapers or are you done no, with that? No, no, I'm done with that. <laughs> no, I graduated. No. Uh, <laughs> now, if I have to, if I have to, if it's me and I'm, I'm alone and I'm, yeah. But now, they're, you know, our our youngest just turned three, so we're about to be completely done with that. So, uh, <laughs> we're we're, yeah. we're 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 just about past all of it. But uh, I've definitely had some conversations uh, with Bruce about his kids. He's uh, he's coaching them now, and it's all, you know, he's had new life experience for sure. Yeah. Oh, oh, and that piece he wrote uh, maybe like a year and a half ago about coaching right. his kids was just one of the best yeah, stories I've ever read. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, his it, relationship with Mike Lee took on an all new meaning. Yeah, it was uh, great stuff. And I think I think Bruce was employee number one or number two at ESPN dot com. I, I believe I, I I don't remember, but anyway, I, we both love Bruce Feldman. Um, yeah. So Timmy, let's let's start with uh, the Rose Bowl. Uh, Alabama gets beat by Michigan in overtime. This your analysis assessment of that game? Well, I think I told you that I liked Alabama to win the game because I felt like Milro would be the difference. And obviously, had they, it would have been because of a play that only Jalen Milro would be able to make. And the play obviously didn't work. And so, ultimately, the the tie did not win the game, and and Michigan. Uh, made a, a drive for the ages. I mean, the game itself was, um, I didn't think particularly well played, but that's not, that's not, uh, uncommon, uh, after these teams have a month layoff. You see this happen a lot, uh, in the college football playoff. And, uh, it happened again here. 
neither team was sharp. Uh, gadget plays uh, turned into calamities for Michigan early in the game. Uh, I thought Alabama, um, for whatever reason, reverted back from an offensive standpoint into the team that we saw uh, before they got their act together about four weeks into the season. Uh, they were, for whatever reason, deciding to, you know, make uh, Jalen Milrow a pocket passer, and he was getting crushed by the Michigan defensive front. I did, I did believe Michigan front was going to be a problem for Alabama because they didn't play anyone as physical as Michigan up front in the SEC, in my opinion, with the exception of Georgia. And um, and I think Michigan's defensive front is better than Georgia's. I really do. Um, this year, without a doubt this year, uh, their front was uh, just magnificent. That's why they were able to bully people around in the the Big Ten the way they did and get away with winning games on the road against top 12 teams without even having to throw a pass. You know, J.J. McCarthy didn't throw a pass in the entire second half against Penn State and they won. So, you know, the game went sort of the way I felt it would. Uh, But I did think that uh, Alabama could win it because of of, uh, of Jalen, and, um, you know, they, they almost did. Um, but that last play uh, was, you know, typical of what Michigan had done to Alabama up front. I mean, it was disrupted uh, with a tackle that just got overpowered, mashed by a defensive end that, that made a great play, a tackle that, that beat another big ugly, as we like to say. And uh, you don't see Alabama get pushed around like that, but that's what disrupted that play, uh, I, I'm I'm one of those that prescribes to the theory that the call was not a bad call; it was just poorly executed. Uh, but I did think that uh, Tommy Reese had a poor day of play calling. I, I don't think that play was a bad play, but I I, did, I didn't think he had a good day, particularly um, in, in the Rose Bowl. Hey Tim, this is Wyatt, the digital editor, and the producer for the show today what a, what seemed why was Alabama not really able to make any offensive adjustments you saw Michigan's defense get a lot of sacks and get a lot of pressure and like you said even on that last play they just kind of the the defensive end and the defensive line just shoved Alabama's offensive line into Milrow so even if he was able to f- cleanly field that snap he wasn't going to be able to go anywhere so how was why was Alabama not really able to make any adjustments well, I, I thought they did make adjustments. I'll disagree with that a little bit in the second half. I did think that they got they got back to playing the, the style of offense that they had played to be successful, and that was rolling out Bill Rowe, getting him out of the pocket, uh, quick passes, quick flares, uh, and and uh, you know there was no time for the Michigan pass rush to to get to him. I think well they had five sacks Michigan did in the first half. Uh, they got a few more later, but not nearly as many as they had been getting. Uh, so I thought Alabama did make some adjustments from the first half to the second half offensively. But again, as is oftentimes the case by there in Tuscaloosa, and I, and I think it's true all through the state of Alabama, uh, fans are conditioned because Nick Saban has conditioned them to always believe it's not what the opponent did or the talent the opponent had. It's the missteps and the mistakes that Alabama makes because otherwise they, they're they supposed to win. Alabama never loses to an opponent. Alabama loses because it doesn't execute or it was not mentally prepared for the game or uh, they, they were asleep at the wheel somehow. It's never because the opposition was actually better than they were. Michigan was better than Alabama in that game. Uh, and, and Alabama could have still won a game. Michigan played, you know, to a, a much higher level by Michigan standards than Alabama did in terms of the physicality of the game. But in terms of being uh, an offensive juggernaut or executing, Michigan had some horrible possessions themselves. Uh, as I said, I, I didn't think the game, and this happens a lot, with highly anticipated ballyhooed uh, college football playoff games when you've had 30 or so days off. You can only be as sharp. And this will change once we get into the 12-team playoff next year, and 
It'll be better when we get to the 16 team playoff in two years, in my opinion. When uh, when the championship game is going to be the third game played in three weeks, okay, or the second game played in three weeks if you get the bye, it's going to be played at a higher level because these teams have been playing real games, just like they do in the NFL. In college football, we have way too long of a layoff. We really do. Um, I, you know, we can make the same statement about Washington uh, play calling, and and uh, at, the, at the end of the game against Texas, uh, they had a bad last two minutes. They really did. But that's just the nature of the beast when you've been off for that length of time. For sure, and I, I wasn't trying to discredit Michigan there. I don't want you to think I was. It was just no, no, no. I'm not. And I'm, no, why? Don't don't take my answer incorrectly. I'm not trying to, to to pounce or anything. I'm just saying that I think adjustments were made. That was the question, and I do believe that adjustments were made. But in the end, the execution was still poor. Uh, uh, for instance, let me let me throw this out. Burton is running an out pattern that should have had him in the end zone. And he wasn't. He was at the three yeah. yard line. And he got stopped. Okay. That was a mistake in execution. So now they got to make another play and they've got no time out. And the play had to be a perfect play to get into the end zone. If it's not a perfect play, the game is over. And obviously it wasn't. So that happened. Um, but I, again, I, I just think after the game, Nick Saban did what he always did, uh, what he always does. He said, uh, it was more of what we did do than what they did. And that's what Nick always said. And and I think his fan base has been conditioned to that, and they believe that no opponent is ever better than they are. And I'm sorry, uh, Nick's wrong on that. And Alabama fans are too. Tim, I absolutely cannot disagree with you on that. And that is like maybe the most cogent analysis of the Alabama fan base I've ever heard. Because, you know, uh, yes, never never our fault. Uh, or never what they do, what we do. Yep. And there, yep. there's there's some truth to both, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Tim, you know, you're, you're, our, you're our two-segment guy. Can you stick around <laughs> for one more? Yeah, I'll be happy All to right. do it. Awesome. All right, listen to Big News Sports. We'll be right back. Barry Buckner here. Down to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. All right, welcome back into Big Noon Sports. We're talking with Tim Brando. Tim, let's uh, get your assessment of the other national national semifinal game between Washington and I'm just blanking. <laughs> Tim, have you ever drawn a blank on air? <laughs> you know, no, I've not. I've drawn blanks at home. <laughs> <laughs> Washington, uh, Texas, the final play of the game. I, 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 it seemed to me that Quinn Ewers was hurt because if he drills that ball in on that uh, that route to the, the uh, front pylon, it seems like an easy touchdown. Texas wins. Just give us your analysis of that. Honestly, um, I really felt like Washington would make the play because they're really good defensively in the red zone, and they did. I thought it was a Herculean uh, play by the the cornerback uh, knocking the ball away. Uh, Yours has been uh, not a hundred percent. I think we all know that. So it's a it's it's. I think it's a reasonable thought that maybe. He didn't have his his right stuff, so to speak, to use a pitcher pitcher analogy. Maybe his fastball wasn't as good. Um, you know, they were toying with the idea, and I noticed that during the game on a couple of occasions, uh, Sean McDonough, who I have tremendous respect for, I think he's the best uh, play-by-play guy of my generation. I really do. I uh, No disrespect intended to Chris Fowler, but Chris is more of a studio host than he is a play-by-play man. Uh, Sean is the best play-by-play guy on college football that ESPN has, in my opinion. Sean, Sean brought up uh, Arch Manning on a couple of occasions. It was subtle. It wasn't, um, it wasn't as though he felt like they're going to make a pit- pitching change necessarily, but he threw the subject out there a couple of times 
Uh, and Manning did warm up a couple of times. I think that gave him reason to uh, make mention of it. And you can bet that during the course of conversation with Sarkeesian and, um, and maybe with uh, Kyle Flood, uh, his offensive you know, line coach that is really his guru uh, on an op- from an offensive standpoint, his right-hand man, you can bet that that subject must have come up for Sean to make mention of it. So you may be right about that. I did not think that uh, – I thought the play, the, the last play you're talking about, though, was just a great defensive play by Washington. And it's the reason, Lars, that I like Washington to win the national championship. Uh, they'll, they'll give up a lot of yards. Michigan will run the ball on them. And they'll run it probably for, you know, 250, 300 yards uh, in the national title game. But I don't think they'll be able to score with Washington. I think Washington's just got way too much big play capability. Michigan has not played anybody uh, in the Big Ten with a quarterback like Michael Pennick. And those three receivers, I think you saw it in the game with Texas, they're just unstoppable. I mean, Polk, McMillan, and uh, Odunze particularly, in my opinion, should have been the Belitnikoff winner. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. got it on really on uh, style points and brand name and, and playing at Ohio State. Uh, Roman Odunze was the best receiver in college football this year, in my opinion. Adunze was just absolutely insane this season. I completely agree that he was the best wide receiver in college football. I'm interested, though. You, we've mentioned that Washington's probably got the best wide receiver trio in the country. I think that's probably a fair assessment to say. Does does Michigan have the defensive backs to, to keep pace, or is this about to be just a, a shootout? You know, is, is Michigan going to score with Blake Corum, and then Washington will turn around and score with Romo Dunze, and you're looking at like a, a 40-point ball game for either team? We're, we could have it over. I don't think Michigan wants that. I think Michigan wants to control the ball, keep Washington off the field, uh, have a manageable game. But it's not like Michigan can't score 40. Uh, they can. Uh, because in this game, you may have to. You know, if you're going to win a national championship, sometimes you got to win in a, in a manner that you're not comfortable with winning. Okay? It's a little bit like uh, those steps that Saban had to take after, you know, he got – boat race uh, by Clemson and and then he went back and said okay I gotta get me I gotta get me some linebackers that are more like safeties that are faster and I've gotta get uh, you know an offense that's uh, more daring and, and so Stark and and then later Lane Kiffin started taking over and you saw what happened um, I, I really I believe in, in that and I think Nick showed without a doubt that he could adjust and adapt and he did um, but I think this is a game that Michigan is going to have far more trouble with dealing with because they're going to, have to be forced to score. They're the team that's going to have to make the adjustment if you want to keep pace with Washington. Um, Penix is just too good. Uh, he, he's the most accurate, by far and away, college passer, uh, and his deep ball is maybe the best deep ball that we've seen uh, in the college game in a really, really long time. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question. It's a compelling question. Uh, I don't know that, I don't know that they are capable of, uh, of getting the job done, Michigan, without having to score at least in the high 30s, uh, to, to keep pace. If Washington doesn't need to possess the ball very long to get points. Um, uh, you know, they don't. Uh, and, and Michigan doesn't want to get caught up into that. So they've got to control the football and, 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 and try to get the, the ground yardage. But it, they run the risk also of scoring quickly. You know, and if Michigan gets caught into that style of game, uh, they, they could be in trouble. It could be fool's gold. You know, it could look good early, and then it could get away from them late. Tim, Penix was just spectacular uh, in the semifinal game. This is just a, a, a barroom debate that you know is going on all throughout Chicago right now. The Bears have the number one overall pick, and they got Justin Fields. And, and you've seen all three of these guys, Caleb Williams included, USC's quarterback, who everybody right. thinks is going to be the number one overall. If you're the GM of the Bears, you got Justin Fields, 
you have the number one pick. Do you go Williams? Do you go Penix? Do you just trade it and stick with Fields? What do you do? Well, based on the people I talk to in the NFL, and there are many of them that I do talk to, uh, it, it sounds like Justin Fields and the Chicago Bears need a break from one another. You know, that, that a, an address change might be the best thing that could happen to both. So with that in mind, I think the Bears are going to probably make a deal. Um, now, do you who's, make a who's deal? A better pro, yeah, who's a better pro prospect between well, the I, and Caleb I, Williams? I, I, think, I think Caleb Williams is a generational quarterback. All right? I, I think he's a he, – he's a uh, – he's somewhere between a uh, – uh, you know, I don't think anyone felt like Mahomes was going to be – what Mahomes is, right, uh, when he got into the league. But I had a good thought about what he might be able to accomplish having seen him at Texas Tech. But he didn't have a whirlwind career, and he wasn't, you know, invited to New York for the Heisman. But we, we certainly knew that the cap- that he had uh, that he had the capability. And, uh, and look what he did. I think he's – Caleb Williams is uh, a Patrick Mahomes type with a Joe Burrow profile, if you will. You know, the physical tools are Burrow-esque. Uh, and I think, but at the same time, he's got an explosive quality that would remind you of Mahomes. Uh, I think he's a, uh, the Auburn fans maybe can relate to this. He, he, he can absolutely take over a game like, uh, like Cam Newton did in his prime. But I think his decision making overall is better than Cam Newton. Uh, so if you had, if it's Caleb or Penix, I still think you take Caleb. Uh, but I've got no problem with anyone saying that wants to make the decision that the face of my franchise is going to be Michael Penix rather than Caleb Williams, just based on character. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. If they felt after interviews that that was the guy they wanted to have. Lars, I would absolutely concur. I'd have no problem with that whatsoever. Sticking with the NFL, this seems to be a pretty strong quarterback class. You've got, you know, two Heisman finalists, two Heisman winners, and we haven't even mentioned Drake May at that point. Do you think that there will be a lot of teams vying for these top five picks to try and get at one of these one of these top level quarterbacks? Or do you think do you think that people are probably just gonna sit back and see how the board plays out and then maybe decide to make a move. And if follow up on that as well, if you're sitting in a general manager's office and you get to make that decision, who who's your top pick? Uh, um, if it's if it's not Caleb Williams, who's your pick? And if it is Caleb Williams, who's after Caleb? Michael Penix. <laughs> For me, Michael Penix. Uh, and, and I don't I don't understand why Penix is is getting the negative uh, reactions from so many. I think it's some say it's because of his age. Some say it's because uh, uh, he, he's, he he doesn't uh, offer a dual threat. Listen, I I think Michael Penix, when he has to run, can run with his with the best of them. I, I've I've seen him do it. He did it in Indiana, but the problem was and the reason he's not running as much now is it got him hurt. He got hurt in Indiana, and and I think maybe the past injury uh, or this notion that he's, he he may not be able to stay healthy. I think it unfairly follows a guy like Penix. Um, to me, Michael Penix was the best quarterback on the best team all year long. Uh, and if he had had, if he had had a breakout game where he really outplayed Bo Nix in either one of those two matchups with Oregon, he would have won the Heisman. But he didn't. Bo Nix was right there with him, played as well as he did. And I think that's the reason why Jaden Daniels was stats that were padded, okay, and they were padded by having uh, games that really didn't matter, and he could just go out and wing it, and Brian Kelly let him wing it. He had these unbelievable numbers that you just could not uh, deny, and that's why Daniels won the Heisman Trophy. And don't get me wrong, I voted for Daniels because I wanted Pinnock or Nick to have a breakout game, and neither one did. So my ballot was was uh, Daniels, then than Penix than than uh, Nick, but it could have yeah. easily been well, Penix that he had, you know, a, a, a big stat advantage over Bo Nix in either one of those two games, but he didn't. 
Tim, I uh, wrote a 5,000 word piece on Bo Nix before he played his first game at Auburn. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him when he was a very young man, 18 years old. I couldn't have been more impressed. Project where he goes in, in, in the draft and, and do you think he will be a guy that you could build an entire franchise around? Yeah, I do. I, I tell you what, I, I see Bo Nix as a physically more impressive version of Drew Brees. I think he plays the position a lot like Drew. Uh, and he's in the locker room. In the locker room, he's, he's a, he's like a Drew Brees kind of guy. But he's, uh, you know, Drew was small. There were questions about him, not just because of the shoulder, but also because of his height. You know, he had a lot of passes blocked uh, when he was coming up out of Purdue. Uh, you know, his ability to throw people open, I think that became a popular statement by uh, a lot of analysts talking about how he plays larger than his stature. Uh, those were all reasons, I think, <laughs> that Nick Saban passed on him and went with Dante Culpepper, uh, and it, if he had gotten Drew, I think we all know history would have changed in college football big time, okay? Um, I, but Bo Nix is the same kind of character, and I think, as I said, plays the position of quarterback in a similar vein to the way Bo Nix does. And uh, his his locker room presence is also quite similar to, to Drew. He, he's a guy that just is a natural-born leader. Um, Bo's going to have a great pro career. Make no doubt about it. A great pro career. I don't know why, but Bo Nix to me just seems to scream Minnesota Viking, and that would be—I think that would be a phenomenal setup for him. Yeah, um, it would be. It for, would be. For all these top quarterbacks, several of them are going to the Senior Bowl and things like that, where general managers and stuff will be able to finally get their, you know, finally be able to sit them down in a room and and talk to these guys a little bit more in depth. What do you what are you thinking they're expecting to see down in Mobile during the Senior Bowl, and what do you think they want to see? Will will some some very big decisions will be made down there in Mobile at the end of the month? They will be. I'm I'm curious how many of the the quote unquote big name QBs are are going to play. I, I I don't know how many will. Uh, I think Bo Bo just said he's going to play. Bo Nix, but yeah, well, that's good. Right. Expected, Penix is rumored. I expected Bo to play for obvious reasons. Uh, it just makes too much sense for him, and it's kind of a welcome home thing in a lot of ways for him too, which I think is wonderful. But uh, I, I don't know if it's going to change anybody's minds. What you know, I, I think a lot of guys can go from. Uh, you know, you, you might go from the third round to the second round. You could go from uh, an undrafted free agent to being drafted at the Senior Bowl. But I don't know that general managers ever change their mind about their first selection based on who does what at the Senior Bowl anymore. Tim, uh, final question. There are so many rumors swirling. Uh, they even got to ESPN and they were talking about it, how Nick Saban is going to retire one, how did these rumors get started? And two, uh, I gotta ask you, do you think he's gonna retire? No. And how do they get started? Stupid programming of two words. Embrace debate. These clowns have to have something to talk about each day. And, uh, no, I don't see Nick Saban retiring. I really don't. Um, it, it boggles the mind. It really does. You know, Lars, what I was doing, and I get it to some extent, uh, when I was doing my radio show, and it, you know, it was an opinion-based show, no doubt about it, it was. Um, we were going to talk about things that just popped up, what fans might ask, and I would, I would, I would give it, uh, some time, or I would try to let them down easily and not trash them for bringing it up. But I would certainly put the rest in a heartbeat something along those lines. I might just say, Listen, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend 15 minutes talking about an odd story here. We're just not going to do that. Let's move on to something else. These Embrace Debate shows are not built that way. They have these blocks of different segments where they're going to force the host to talk about whatever they believe they need to talk about. And you know what, Lars? Some of these guys might be there in their third year out of Ithaca or Syracuse and they call themselves producers, and they're telling the talent what they need to talk about. And, they, and then the talent in turn starts talking about it. It makes no sense. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. 
uh, and it comes up, and it, it's it's terrible. I I, I think that uh, talk radio and uh, and uh, opinion based programming is fine. You know what Colin Coward does is fine, but these these shows that are based on you take this point and you take that point and let's scream and holler about it. What 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 that's happened what's wrong to with object- our industry? Tim, this is a journalism question, but what, what real quick, what what happened to objectivity in sports media? Really, in all there, media? There, yeah. <laughs> there, there is none. <clears throat> it's like, um, it, it's like sports has now decided to go the way of news, unfortunately. And that is, we're going to tune over to MSNBC if we're liberals. We're going to tune over to Fox News if we're uh, conservatives. And we're going to listen to what we want to listen to. Because anyone that doesn't have the same uh, ideology as me, I don't want to hear. And it's really unfortunate because sports, much more so than politics, should be about uh, finding happy medium, conversation pieces. I, I've got a lot of friends uh, in the sports business that are liberal, and they listen to me talk about sports, and they feel like, hey, Brando's, uh, he's a progressive, Right. But then when I start talking politics and they know I'm a conservative, they go, oh, my God, you're a walking anomaly. <laughs> wow. You know, uh, uh, the days of Edward R. Edward R. Murrow are dead. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's a shame. It really is. Uh, Timmy, thank you so much. You're the best. Appreciate your time. Happy to be uh, on, Lars. Tune in thank on you, uh, thank Saturday. You, I've got some of Melvin St. John's on Fox at noon. Yeah, we didn't even get into how you've been crisscrossing the United States covering college oh. basketball. We'll do that next week. <laughs> we'll do it, Sal. Okay, buddy. Right, thank you, Tim. All right, here's going to Big News Sports. We'll be right back. Tap down to the plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. All right, welcome back into the show. Listen to Big News Sports. I'm Lars Anderson. Big thanks to Roger Hoover for joining us, for Tim Brando joining us. Hey, Wyatt, we got some breaking news here. Give it to us. Yeah, Alabama running back Roydell Williams has announced that he is returning to the Crimson Tide for another season. And then Alabama defensive lineman Justin Aboigbe has announced that he is entering the NFL draft. So best of luck to Aboigbe and for Roydell. Welcome back. We're rain chasing one more season. Are you surprised by either of these announcements? I'm not surprised by Boyd I think, you know, his return from the injury last season to having a pretty good role this season was, was very impressive, and I commend him for it. He'll be a great defensive lineman in the NFL. And then for Roydell, I am a little shocked by it just because of the talent behind him and Justice Jam and Richard Young. I'm interested to see what those three are going to do now. Do one of them decides to tra- or to test the transfer portal a little bit, or do they all say, "Hey, we're here for a running back by committee"? And you know, a, a good veteran running back is always good to have on any team. And so, Roydell coming back in that sense is a good idea. I I don't know about the development though about the guys behind him. What round, real quick, does a boy be go in? He'll be a late draft pick, day three pick. If I had to put a final guess on it, I'd probably say late fifth round, early sixth round. But he's going to be a really cheap, really good defensive lineman for for several years in the NFL before he hopefully gets a second bag. Hey, great work today, Wyatt. Appreciate you filling in for Matt Coulter. And uh, we need to get out. You've listened to Big Noon Sports. We'll be back in 22 hours. Hey, this-